Good morning and welcome to Highview Church Online. We're so incredibly glad that you and your families have stopped by today and taken this moment to worship together with us. We have just a couple of quick announcements before we get started of some tools and resources that will help you engage in today's service. Take a moment before we begin and drop out of this video and go visit the description where you'll find several helpful links with tools and resources that again will help you engage in today's service just a little bit better. The first link you're gonna find is to a PDF form that you can print at home that we call our Highview Kids Sermon Guide. In that document, you'll find some fill in the blank opportunities for your kids to take notes as they listen to today's service, some follow-up content where you as parents can be equipped to have a worship from home experience in the week to follow, as well as some other activities and coloring sheets that your kids will enjoy. Next, you're going to find a link for our online giving platform. There we ask our members and uh, perhaps even our guests, if you would like to give a gift to Highview Church today, please do so using our online giving platform. We aspire here to be joyfully generous people at Highview Church, and we love to give of our time and our talents, but also our treasures. And those things, and those resources help ministry continue on just like this, as well as as we prepare to get back together again real soon. So thank you to our members for your joyful generosity during these difficult times. We also have a link for our guests. If you are here for the first time, or perhaps you've watched with us for a few weeks now, but you wanna to get to know us a little bit better, please know we definitely want to get to know you and your families. So take just a few minutes, go down to the description of our video, click the link to fill out our digital connect card, or perhaps a simpler way, just leave a comment on this video saying, I'm new, and we will follow up with you after today's service. Well, now grab your Bibles, gather your families around your device, and let's worship the Lord together today. Good morning, Highview Church. I pray you're all doing well and staying healthy and safe. We miss everyone, but we're excited this morning to take some time now, gather around together as a family, or, or grab your iPhone, or maybe you're sitting in front of the TV, but wherever you're at, let's just take some time now and let's uh, gather around together. And even though we're scattered all across the city and, and this West Georgia area, let's uh, just unite our hearts together with one theme, and that is to make much of Jesus, to lift him high, to worship him this morning. I wanted to start this morning by reading uh, the first few verses of Psalms chapter 18, and this is what it says. It says this, I love you, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer my God and my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold, and I call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised, and I am saved from my enemies. It's good news this morning, church, that our God is a fortress. He's a stronghold that we can run to in times of trouble. And so this morning, I thought we would just open our service and sing together this wonderful hymn uh, written by Martin Luther, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. Let's sing together.
thank you this morning that we are secure in you. Lord, we thank you this morning that when all around us is shifting stand on Christ, the solid rock, we stand. And so, Lord, we renew our faith and our trust in you this morning, God. Lord, we take time as the people of God to quieten our hearts and to turn them heavenward to look to a good sovereign God who is working all things for the good of his people. Lord, and to proclaim with one voice, we trust you. Lord, you are holding us secure this morning. And so, Father, with all of the things in the world that are there to bring us fear and um, anxiety and worry, Lord, we're not um, unaware of those things. Lord, we see them, we experience them, we know they're there. Lord, we lament over those things, Father. They affect us. But Lord, deeper than those things, 
Father, is the truth that you have bought us, that we belong to you. And because of this, we are secure. And so, Father, we put our confidence and our trust in you. Nothing can separate us from your love this morning that is offered to us in Christ. And so, Father, now we pray as we look to your word that you would be glorified, that your people would be edified, Father, that lost people would hear the gospel and believe. We thank you for this time, and we pray all of this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Good morning, and welcome to Highview Church Online. My name is Chad Williams. I'm the lead pastor here at Highview Church, and I am delighted to be joining you this morning, wherever you are, to worship our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and grab them and turn to the book of Matthew with me, Matthew chapter 17. And this morning, I'm going to begin reading in verse 14, and we're going to read through verse 20. Matthew chapter 17, starting in verse 14. And when they came to the crowd, a man came up to him, and kneeling before him, said, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he has seizures and he suffers terribly. For often he falls into the fire and often into the water. And I brought him to your disciples, and they could not heal him. And Jesus answered, O faithless and twisted generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? Bring him here to me. And Jesus rebuked the demon, and it came out of him, and the boy was healed instantly. And then the disciples came to Jesus privately and said, why could we not cast it out? And he said to them, Because of your little faith. For truly I say to you, if you have faith like a grain of mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, Move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray together. God, as we gather as the scattered church, wherever we are, we now ask that you would meet us. The Holy Spirit, we ask you would teach us, instruct us, help us know Christ better. Strengthen our faith this morning. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I am not a religious person, but I have faith. A non-Christian friend of mine shared those words with me during a long conversation on the topic of spirituality. Listen carefully to the words again. I am not a religious person, but I have faith. A, a statement like that is common in our culture. The world has an interesting relationship with the word faith. It means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. It's impossible to know what someone means when they use the word faith. Now, now let me admit something as a, a follower of Jesus. Most modern Christians aren't helping bring clarity to the issue of what faith is. We throw around the word faith, but lack a true understanding of what biblical faith is as Christians. And that's a serious problem. A lot of people who profess Jesus do not have a biblical definition for the word faith. Specifically, saving faith in Jesus is the only hope sinners have for forgiveness of sins and eternal life. So today, we're going to talk about this kind of faith. We're going to talk about what true faith is, and I want to challenge you to rethink your definition of the word faith based on what Jesus teaches here in Matthew chapter 17. This morning we're going to look at two aspects of faith, negative and positive. Two things specifically. Part one, we'll see the danger of doubt. The danger of doubt. And then in part two, the power of of faith. And as we look at these two different points, I believe we'll begin to see a, a clarified vision of what faith biblically really is. So let's jump right in. Matthew chapter 17, 
Verse 9 is where we begin. And this will help us establish some context here as we work ourselves through this passage. I'm going to start in verse 9. As they were coming down the mountain, this is Jesus and his disciples, Jesus commanded them, tell no one the vision until the Son of Man is raised from the dead. So since we're just diving headlong into this passage, we need to ask a couple of questions. We need to establish some context. First of all, what mountain is Jesus and his disciples coming down from? And what vision is Jesus telling them not to talk about? Those are the first two questions. Well, for those answers, look with me at Matthew 17, verses 1 and 2. After six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, his brother, and led them up to a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became white as light. And behold, there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with him. So Jesus takes Peter, James, and John up to the top of a mountain and is there. He is transfigured. In this intense scene, the curtain on who Jesus is is pulled back. He is seen in all of his holiness and his glory and his majesty as the Son of God. And he is revealed to be the Son of God in all of his glory and all of his holiness and all of his majesty to these three disciples. Now, it's a pivotal moment in your New Testament. Pivotal. Because it removes any doubt about who Jesus is. Jesus is God. And these last two weeks, the previous two sermons you've heard, have been reinforcing this particular issue. Last week, Pastor Tyler did a fantastic job telling us who it is we are to abide in, and that is Jesus. And why is that such good news? Because he is God, the source of life itself. And two weeks ago, we looked at Jesus being God. We looked at the true identity of Jesus, the light of the world. And so the Mount of Transfiguration is just simple confirmation of these realities. Now, we know Peter, James, and John are on the Mount of Transfiguration. They're exposed to the glorified Jesus in all of his power and majesty. And these guys are speechless, of course, right? Well, sort of. One of them, even immersed in the holy radiance of Jesus himself, still can't keep quiet. Would any of you at home like to guess which of these disciples couldn't keep quiet on the Mount of Transfiguration? You guessed it, the Apostle Peter. Verse 4, chapter 17, And Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good that we are here. If you wish... I will make three tents here, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. Yep, you read that right. Jesus transfigured in his glory, and Peter's response is to build Moses and Elijah and Jesus a tent to dwell in, and hey, we'll just all hang out here. So Jesus and his three disciples have this dramatic moment on the mountain, and then as quickly as it happens, it's over. Matthew 17, verse 9 tells us they came down the mountain, and that's where we pick up our story here today. After a literal, spiritual mountaintop experience, we come to our first point today, the danger of doubt. Look with me at verses 14 and six through 16. And when they came to the crowd, a man came up to him and kneeling before him said, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he has seizures and he suffers terribly. For often he falls into the fire and often into the water. And I brought him to your disciples, and they could not heal him. Now here Jesus is approached by a man with a sick, demon-possessed son. And lots of people, we must say, sought healing from Jesus during his earthly ministry. Lots of people were healed by Jesus. But only a small few of those healings are found in multiple Gospels. This heal healing here is actually found in three of the four. It's found in Matthew here. It's found in Luke and John. This is a critical healing of sorts we're going to see in Matthew 17. It has a lot of significance. 
First, remember when this story occurs. Remember what just happened. The Mount of Transfiguration had just happened. And after this intense moment of corporate worship in the presence of the transfigured Christ, hearing the booming voice of God and the Father that commanding the disciples to listen to my beloved Son, after this experience, they are suddenly brought right back to reality of life in a fallen world. A desperate father with a sick son. Maybe I could put it this way. If, if the Mount of Transfiguration was a Sunday morning mountaintop experience, this encounter with the desperate father and a sick son is a Monday morning kind of experience. You ever experienced that kind of letdown? That kind of back to reality moment? We're often susceptible to struggle with our faith after intense spiritual events or seasons. It's often after the high highs that the low lows hurt all the more. The good news, however, is this, believers. The same exact Jesus who was with you on the mountain then is with you in the valley now. Maybe I could put it this way. The goodness of Jesus is never diminished by the difficulty of our circumstances. And so this is a very sobering moment here. Jesus and his disciples encounter the sadness and the brokenness of life in a fallen world. Again, verses 14 and 15, they came to the crowd and a man came up to him and kneeling before him said, Lord, have mercy on my son for he has seizures and he suffers terribly. For often he falls into the fire and often into the water. It's a weary, heartbroken dad who's approaching Jesus here, and he begs him for help. He tells Jesus this boy has seizures. Now we know now, some 2,000 years later, with advanced advancements in the medical field, we know that more than likely this young man was an epileptic. And we could say that with some degree of certainty. And it's something that still brings much suffering into someone's life and their families, for sure. But it must be said, in the ancient world, epilepsy, like blindness or lameness, was almost a death sentence. We find out later in the story, in verse 18, that this boy's physical problems are made worse by demon possession. He has physical health issues and spiritual issues as well. And we see the destructive influence of the enemy here in this young boy's life. Look at how the enemy influences this suffering boy. I want you to see the merciless nature of the enemy. If your blood boils thinking about it, that's okay. Often he falls into the fire and often into the water. That's what verse 15 says. Influenced by the enemy to destroy himself by throwing himself into fire or into water. That's the pattern of the enemy. Preying on the physically sick and weak with one intention, and that is destruction. The father here, he's out of options. He's desperate. He's afraid. His son is suffering both physically and spiritually here. And as a parent myself, I can feel this man's desperation. It's tangible. It's powerful. And to add to his desperation, he's already been let down by Jesus' disciples. Verse 16 says, listen, I brought him to your disciples, and they couldn't heal him. They've already let me down. I mean, ouch, right? So imagine the awkwardness of this scene. This man comes, he bows down before Jesus, he calls him Lord, he asks for his help, and he says, these clowns, these followers of yours, they've really disappointed me already. They have no answers. Now, if you're new to Christianity, I want to let you in on a family secret. Christians are not Christ. I, I can hear the amens in every living room this is being streamed into. Christians aren't Christ. 
We are to be Jesus impersonators. We're not Jesus imposters. We are not Jesus. A man named Jared Wilson, he has this wonderful quote about what it means to be a pastor, and I really relate to it. He said a man came up to him once. He said, what do you do for a living? And Jared said, well, I'm a pastor. And the man said, oh, so you're the one with all the answers. And Jared responded, no, 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 I point guys to that guy. In other words, I don't have all the answers. I'm not Jesus. I'm not the answer. My job is to point others to him, to Jesus. Listen, imposters, they try and convince you they're someone else. When we live like Jesus, as imperfectly as it is, we do so to point others to Jesus, not us. The disciples of Jesus had failed this man. They had come up short, but this man didn't let that stop him from pursuing Jesus. And that's an important word for all of us here this morning. Listen to me really carefully on this. If you stop following Jesus because Christians are the worst sometimes, you still quit following Jesus. Never let your disappointment in followers of Jesus keep you from coming to Jesus. Know the difference. Christians, they're not Christ. Are they called to be like him? Yes. Do they fall short of that? Yes. Do I fall short of that? Yes. And if you're a Christian watching this, I know you fall short of this. The point is, we point others to Jesus. Never take your eyes off of Jesus, as you follow him. And a real helpful way to rein in your disappointment of followers in Jesus that you're inevitably going to feel. If you're new to Christianity, you might not know this yet, but you will. You're going to become at some point very disappointed in a Christian if you're not already. Consider how often we disappoint others. Are you bummed by someone falling short Consider how short you fall every day. Christians will disappoint you at some point. The disciples had disappointed this man. Christians will disappoint you. Jesus never will. So this man comes to Jesus as one last gaff shot at seeing his sick and disabled son healed, and Jesus' disciples have been, been unable to help. How is Jesus going to respond here? Well, probably not like you would expect. It's not the response you would expect Jesus to give this desperate man whose son is in such bad shape. Verse 17, Jesus answered, O faithless and twisted generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? Bring him here to me. Huh? (laughs) Jesus responds, to this man with something like holy annoyance. And here in this one chapter, we see Jesus in all of his deity on the Mount of Transfiguration. And here we see Jesus in all of his humanity. Jesus looks around and he sees a crowd full of doubters broken up into two camps. You have those who do not have faith in him at all. That's the scribes and the Pharisees. They're in the crowd and those who are struggling to have faith in him. You have both groups of people, but everyone is struggling or, or, or lacking faith in Jesus. And apparently we find out the quickest way to annoy Jesus is to doubt him. Jesus' main frustration here seems to be the lack of faith in his disciples, first and foremost. And where does this response from Jesus come from? I mean, again, it's possible that three of the four gospel writers remember this event so well because maybe they had never heard Jesus so angry before. They'd never heard him talk like this. Maybe that's why it stuck out to them. But what makes you just respond this way? Jesus sees the very real threats to our faith here. There are two types of fraudulent faith we must be aware of here. They both stand in sharp contrast to saving faith. The first is what I call if-you-can faith. If you can. This man approached Jesus to heal his son, but he had his doubts. He had enough faith to approach Jesus, but not enough faith to rest in the fact Jesus could heal his son. 
In Mark's account of this same story, we get a uh, additional detail about this conversation. Verse 20 of Mark chapter 9, they brought the boy to him, and when the spirit saw him, immediately it convulsed in the boy. So this demonic spirit convulsed in the boy when he came to Jesus, and he fell on the ground and rolled about, foaming at the mouth, and Jesus asked his father, how long has this been happening to him? And he said, from childhood. Verse 22, and it has often cast him into fire and water to destroy him, but if you can do anything... Have compassion on us and heal us. If you can. If you can. Three words that really offend Jesus. If you can. With three words, this man reveals the cracks in his weakened faith. And Jesus knows there is a direct connection between sin and the struggle of faith. That's why he calls this generation faithless and twisted. It's one thing to pray, if you will heal if you will bless it's another thing to pray if you can to pray if you will if you will god do this or if you will god do this it affirms the sovereign power of god to pray if you can denies the sovereign power of god there's the difference the difference of those two prayers is as wide as salvation itself this is huge The challenge of faith this man was facing is the same challenge we often face ourselves. Uncertainty about the power of Jesus. Have you ever just been uncertain about the power of Jesus? We have enough faith to come to Jesus in the midst of circumstances, but not enough faith to believe that Jesus is powerful enough to do anything about him. What does your prayer life say about your faith in the power of Jesus? Of Jesus. I know Christians who have given up on asking God for help. Childlike faith has been replaced by worldlike skepticism. And what's Jesus' response to this man's if you can statement? Verse 23 of Mark chapter 9, Jesus said to him, If you can, <laughs> all things are possible for one who believes. Immediately the father of the child cried out and said, I love this prayer, I believe. Help my unbelief. Faith, you see, produces prayers that beg for stronger faith. Let your struggle for stronger faith encourage you, brothers and sisters, not discourage you. If you've ever prayed, I believe, help my unbelief, you get it. You get what it's like to follow Jesus. You get what it's like to trust him. So Jesus, though annoyed and maybe even offended by this man's weak faith and his power to help the boy, still shows mercy to this man and heals this man's sick, demon-possessed son. But this man is not only struggling with faith here. The disciples of Jesus, they're struggling themselves with their faith. Now, we've seen the challenge of uncertainty in the power of Jesus. Now we see another challenge to our faith. I call it, why can't we faith? We've talked about if you can faith. This is Why can't we faith? Verse 18 of Matthew 17. Jesus rebuked the demon. It came out of the boy, and the boy was healed instantly. Here you see Jesus' healer, right? And then the disciples came to Jesus privately and said, "Um, Why could we not cast it out? After Jesus healed the boy and the crowd dispersed, the disciples, they come up to Jesus. They say, Jesus, hey, what's up? I mean, you gave us power to heal and exercise demons in the authority of your name, but what happened back there? Why couldn't we do that? And Jesus, of course, had given them the power to do just that in Matthew chapter 10. So what happened? Why were the disciples unable to do anything about this boy's condition? Well, the disciples had strong certainty. That wasn't the problem. But their certainty was not in the power of Jesus, but in their own power, in their own self-sufficiency. Why could we not cast it out no mention of jesus no mention of his name no mention of his power or authority our problem you see is not always a lack of faith it's the presence of faith that's misplaced that's put in something other than jesus it's not that we don't have faith we're just placing it in the wrong places strong faith in self usually reveals weak faith in god anxious doubt it's an act of 
faith, but the object of that faith is self. And that was the problem. When we are racked with worry and doubt, we're revealing where our faith is truly placed. These men were so used to God working powerfully through them that they foolishly forgot their complete dependence on Him. And Jesus is Christian. Listen, you are a vessel of my power. You're never the source of it. You see, before Jesus strengthens our faith in Him, He often dismantles our faith in ourselves. And sometimes that's very painful. Again, I've never heard a Christian say, I don't need Jesus, but I've seen countless self-professions, self professing Christians live as if they do not need Jesus. Let me talk to church leaders for a second. Are we telling everyone but ourselves to trust Jesus? I'm concerned for the Christian who calls everyone else to have faith that they don't have. A question for you, when your life is over, will your legacy be they trusted Jesus or they trusted self? These are two of the great challenges to our faith. Uncertainty about the power of Jesus, uncertainty in the power of self. We move now from the danger of doubt to the power of faith. The disciples asked Jesus what was wrong with their faith, and this is the response he gives them. He tells them, here's what was wrong. Verse 20 of Matthew 17. He said to them, because of your little faith, for truly I say to you, if you had faith like the grain of a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. Now, is Jesus saying that we are to walk around body slamming mountains into bodies of water? And if we can't do that, we don't have faith? No. This is called hyperbole. Jesus is teaching us what faith actually is and why it is so powerful. If someone on the street asked you to define faith, what would you say? Faith is. For Christians, we better have a biblical answer for this, since according to Romans 5 verse 1, our salvation depends on it. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So what's the best way to define faith? What's the best way to define faith? Faith is leaning everything onto Christ, trusting Him and His righteousness alone to save you, to keep you up. You see, when Jesus tells His disciples about the power of mustard seed-sized faith, Jesus is pointing them away from the size of their faith and pointing them towards the object of of it. And that leads us to this one main point for this message, and it's this. The strength of our faith is found in the strength of the Jesus we are trusting. And maybe we need to remember the children's hymn. We are weak, but he, he's strong. That's why Jesus immediately reminds his followers of the gospel in verse 22 of Matthew 17, as they were gathering in Galilee, Jesus said to them, the Son of Man is about to be delivered in the hands of men, and they will kill him, and he will be raised on the third day. You see, the gospel is jet fuel on the small embers of faith. Struggling to trust God in the present, is that where you're at? Preach the gospel to yourself. Let the gospel embolden you to step out in faith. Listen, there's a direct connection between believing the gospel and trusting God with our future. I love what William Carey said, one of the great missionaries of the 19th century. Expect great things from God, attempt great things for God. Church, if our faith is growing weak by looking around, maybe it's time to look up. Our faith is in King Jesus, and our faith is strong, not because of the strength of it or the size of it, but the object of it, and that's Jesus Faith is trusting Jesus. Not in your own ability to manipulate God to get what you want. That's a false gospel. Faith is banking eternity on Jesus being enough. And though we will face suffering, perhaps persecution, we will not lose heart. For we are trusting completely in Jesus and Jesus alone and our mustard seed sized faith will not be shaken because it is placed in an unshakable God.
Let me close with this scripture from Hebrews 12. Let this strengthen your faith if it's weak this morning. Hebrews 12, verse 28 and 29. Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And thus, let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. Let's pray together. God, we thank you for these words of Jesus, these challenging words that stretch our faith in difficult moments. Help us not to trust in ourselves, but in you and your finished work alone. We ask all this in the name of the object of our faith, and that is Jesus. Amen and amen. Hey there, thanks again for joining us for Highview Church Online today. If you haven't already, visit the description of this video and take advantage of the resources that are there for you and your families. If you have not downloaded the Highview Kids Sermon Guide, go ahead and grab that, print it at home, and you'll have some opportunities to follow up with your kids from today's service and discuss the truths that Pastor Chad preached for us. Also, for our members, we want to ask if you'll visit the online giving platform and give your online gift there, as well as for our guests. If this is your first or second or third time watching with us, we really want to get to know you better. So before you leave this video, fill out our digital connect card or simply leave a comment saying, I'm new and we want to follow up with you after this week is over. Well, thanks again for joining us for Highview Church Online, and we'll see you next week.